supposed to be looking, by the way? That camera? Yes. Okay. Three, two, one. Good morning. Welcome to Fredericksburg United Methodist Church. We are excited you have chosen to worship with us today. We are excited to spread God's love with those beyond these walls and those present in person. If you're worshiping online today, we'd love to connect more deeply with you, so please fill out the online connection card, which can be found under online worship on our webpage. Next Sunday is our yearly tradition of Children's Sabbath. We hope you'll check back in to see how the children of the church will help lead us in worship. Sunday, November 1st, will be a celebration of the saints of the church on All Saints Day and a don't miss virtual concert at 3 p.m. that afternoon hosted by our music ministry. We've got some great small groups going and some that will start soon, like Disciple 2, children and youth opportunities for engagement, and tons of service opportunities to get involved with, like the uh, VCR trail cleanup coming up on October 24th. Something for everyone. We invite you to check out our webpage, fumcva.org, or our f Facebook page to see all the ways to connect with us. We want to honor our veterans, our communication team is working to put together a montage of pictures, video clips, and information for a slideshow on the Sunday before Veterans Day, November 8th. If you have anything you could and are willing to share with us, with permission, we'd love to honor you and your family. Holy Communion will be part of today's worship. We invite you to participate in this if you are joining us live at 11.15 a.m. You will want to gather juice or water if you don't have juice and crackers or bread. Check the online worship page for details on how to prepare the elements if you are unfamiliar. We are glad you are here, whether in person or virtually. Now let's open our hearts and minds for music and the message. Join me in the responsive call to worship, which is printed on the screen. Brothers and sisters, we are loved by God and chosen by the Lord Jesus. We have turned from idols to serve the living and true God. We are approved by God 
and entrusted with his gospel. Our hope and our joy is to glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes. As we worship together, may the Lord make our love increase, may he strengthen our hearts, and, and so we shall be blameless and holy. May God himself, the God of peace, make us holy through and through. The one who calls us is faithful. He will do it. sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you Lord prepare a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you Lord prepare sanctuary pure and holy tried and true with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you everybody and happy Sunday. My name is Jillian Murray and I am the Children's Ministry Director here at Fredericksburg United Methodist Church and I will be delivering your children's message right now. 
So today, Pastor Jim is going to be preaching from the letter to the Thessalonians. Now, just as a refresher, we know that these letters were written by a man named Paul who traveled all over parts of what is now modern Europe and Asia talking about Jesus and spreading the gospel to the early churches. So I brought with me a very simple object, just a plain thank you card. So how many of you at home have ever had to write a thank you note? I'm sure you've had to write many, many of them before. So when do we write thank you notes? Usually we write thank you cards when somebody does something really nice for us, maybe an act of service, or usually when they give us presents. So I can remember at Christmas time and, and my birthday, my mom would sit me down with a list of people that I had to write thank you notes to and a stack of cards. And my hands would hurt so much from having to write all of those thank you notes. It's such a nice way though for us to show our appreciation for a gift or an act of service. Now, have you ever written a thank you card for somebody for just being who they are? For their presence in your life? Maybe that seems a little bit strange. Maybe it seems weird to send a thank you card to somebody for just being themselves, right? Well, today, Paul writes in the scripture, we give thanks to God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. Now, he's referring to the Thessalonians in this letter. He thanks the Thessalonians, not for anything that they've really done or a gift that they have given him, but simply for their faith and for being good Christians. Paul didn't get anything from them, but he was so grateful for their faithfulness and for their friendship. Paul found so much joy in offering thanks to God for the many examples of proof that God was working in their lives. In telling them thank you, Paul helped to encourage them and to continue to grow in their faith in spreading that good news about Jesus. They were just simply being good Christians. They didn't give him anything, and they didn't do anything really for him. It was just who they were in their hearts. So today, I encourage you to maybe write your own thank you note. Write a note to somebody who you admire or somebody who has helped you learn and grow and have fun. Send that note, but also thank God for those people's presence in your life and ask that God give them strength and continue to bless them, just as Paul did. Thank you. Amen. As we come to our time of congregational prayer this week, we have several joys and concerns to share among us. Um, there are praises in our congregation for successful medical procedures, and some of our members that we mentioned in the past week beginning to feel better. And as we come to mention our concerns, we are mindful of Bill Milby and his family and the loss of his wife, Anne. Her service was held here in our sanctuary on Friday, and we want to continue to remember Bill and his family in our prayers and our thoughts. We also extend our sympathies and remember um, Maxine and Bob Moore and the loss of their brother-in-law. That's also Catherine Council and the Council family's uh, uncle. So we remember those families as well. We have um, Michael King, who continues on our health concern list. He's moved into a rehab facility. And we continue to remember Brian Brandt and his battle uh, with health concerns. We also remember our nation divided as we come closer to this time of election. And we pray for unity, the unity we find in God. And we also continue to pray for those that are suffering from ongoing aftermath or continuing natural disasters, as well as the battle against the global COVID situation. So we take all of this, our joys and our concerns, to God now in prayer. Let us pray. Amazing God, we come before you this morning with all that we have and all that we are, knowing that every good and perfect gift comes from you, our Heavenly Father. Lord, your love for us is unending, and for that we give you thanks. We give you thanks most of all for that love made known to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we just pray, Lord, that 
through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would come closer to that love even more, that as we draw near to you, we would be transformed as individuals and as the body of Christ here into the likeness of Jesus, that we would follow along as we've been talking in these recent weeks to come and see his work, to be a part of his ongoing ministry of healing and grace in the world, of that light and hope, and to invite others along the way. So fill us with your spirit this day. We thank you for the goodness that we know around us, the beauty of the changing trees here in our downtown area, just the joys that come with this time of year from uh, family traditions to gatherings to things that we have in our hearts on the horizon that we long for. We ask, Lord, that as we thank you for these good gifts and for the healing work of your hand among us, that you also be with the concerns of our hearts. Lord, we lift these to you that we've named this day, those that are in the heavy weight of grief. Come near to them, Lord. Comfort them and offer them peace. For those that are continuing to battle illness and diseases like cancer, we just ask for your comfort and your care and for your healing power. For concerns in our heart that may be hard to name, but yet are still heavy and burdens, help us, Lord, to share our burdens with you and to rest in your amazing grace. For the world around us, for our community, for our nation, for the tensions that we feel in the upcoming election and the divisions that we feel, Lord, help us as the people of Christ to be unified in you and to see hope in and through you for all the struggles that present themselves for those that are without a roof over their head from the recent uh, storm, Delta, coming through the Southland or who are struggling with nothing in the aftermath of the fires out west. We ask for your healing. We ask for the work of missionaries and missions like the United Methodist Committee on Relief to just be unleashed, to be instruments of your grace and healing and help us to find our own place in those ministries and in those ways to reach out in your love. Comfort the broken, be near to the weary. And Lord, lift our spirits in the midst of this ongoing time of social distance and separateness. Help us to feel even more interconnected in and through you Help us to root our hope for today and tomorrow and for all the time to come in and through your goodness. And we will forever sing your praises. Thank you, Lord. We pray this prayer and we look to you, Lord, in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it's time now to consider our offerings for this week. And as a senior pastor here in the church, I just want to extend my thanks and the thanks of our church leadership for your ongoing generosity and your givings to our church. In this recent season of natural disaster, some of you have been very faithful to you, even above and beyond giving to the United Methodist Committee on Relief. And those funds are still needed and so appreciated. We appreciate you supporting our ministries and then those places of need here in our local community and outward into the world. There are many ways that you can give, and I'll encourage you to look at the link that comes forth in your stream that gives you information about how you can give to our church, or you can go to our church's webpage. And that's fumcva.org and click on the give link and it will outline the many ways that you can give to our church. We are open to doing that electronically. You can mail us your gifts. You can stop by the church. And we thank you for your faithfulness in that. This week in our reflection on the ministries of Come and See in our church, I have the joy of introducing a wonderful video, a brief video for you, that talks about our Just Ask ministry. You may remember that ministry from last fall, a group organized uh, to come together to help lead us in connecting to our passion, our strengths, and our gifts in the call to work and see all the people among us. And so I invite you now to take a look at this special video that highlights that ministry. Yeah. 
Hey everyone, this is Pastor Josh, and I'm here with Allison Xanthopoulos, and we have the joy today of talking about uh, seeing all the people and how we're doing that with our Just Ask team. Allison, what what is our Just Ask team? That's a great question, Pastor Josh. Pa Just Ask um, was a solution to helping connect you with the ministries of the church um, in an easy and quick format with a pamphlet or a booklet. Um, you might recall that you saw a huge booklet in our pews uh, previous to COVID that talked about a lot of the ministries and history. So Just Ask is a smaller um, format of that. And during this time, we are attempting to shrink that booklet to what is currently going on right now. That sounds like a great mission and a great team. I know uh, a lot of folks may be wondering how I can get involved and might just want someone to ask them. Um, so I'm curious, what is the Just Ask team up to right now? We have lots of opportunities for engaging in the different ministries of the church, the community dinner, which you've seen recent video for, and food pantry, definitely. Um, we have shrunk this book down to what is currently happening um, in the church and community during these COVID times. And that book um, is going to be laid out in different um, levels of comfort. So number one would be, you can do this from home in your pajamas uh, on your computer, especially if you're just minimally computer savvy. Um, number two is very uh, small level of uh, contact and with some precautions and then number three would be um, more public interaction like serving at the food pantry and curbside delivery so these are different um, levels of comfort that you can find in our booklet and they will be um, there's lots of options I love that for uh, folks that are looking to be in ministry I think this booklet is going to be a great way for them uh, to see what is uh, going on right now and for them to choose uh, based on their their current comfort level with everything going on um, what might be a great fit for them where their passions meet need uh, during this time so we are excited for the just ask team to share this booklet with the church in uh, the coming weeks and for all of us to just see all the people definitely um, you'll also find some ways to connect in small groups if you aren't connected to one either so there's definitely some Bible studies going on and Pastor Josh is leading one on disciplines right now and um, there's uh, small groups for um, adults and um, definitely youth and lots of things you can do from home. Dear God, the time of celebrating harvest is upon us as we transition to the fall season. We celebrate the bounty of so many blessings as we come to this part of worship. Forgive us when we forget to show gratitude in the small joys as well as the large joys. Bless the work of the Just Ask team. May their passion for helping all of us to grow urge us to reach out in new ways to our church family and those beyond the walls of FUMC. Take our gifts for use as you see fit. Help us to remember all we offer came from you first, and we ask this all in your blessed Son's name. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, with everybody around uh, our city and, and county and around the nation who are tuning in to our stream service. Our scripture reading for today comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. And I invite you to hear this word of God. Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Grace and peace to you. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers constantly, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, But everywhere, your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Over the past several weeks, we have been preaching in a series called Come and See. The focus of that series has been to help us to see how we, as a church, can learn to truly see and reach out to the people around us. We began with Jesus' invitation to a couple of John the Baptist followers to come and see what Jesus was doing. In the weeks that followed, we talked about, talk about how Jesus invited the disciples more deeply into his ministry and to become as he was. Over the last few weeks, we've looked at various New Testament churches established by the Apostle Paul. The Corinthian church, as Pastor Gina told us two weeks ago, struggled to get it right. They found it difficult to embrace the invitation to follow the example that Paul set. Last week, Pastor Josh told the story of the Philippian church and their efforts to embrace the mission with joy and multiply that joy in the people they encountered. This week, we want to look at the church in Thessalonica. Here we find a church that Paul commends for their efforts to embrace the gospel message and fruitfully share it with their neighbors. This sets the Thessalonians apart from so many New Testament churches. Who were these faithful Christians that Paul gives such unrestrained thanks for? And what can be learned from them to help us in our mission to see all the people in our own community? Paul and his companions established the church in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. This is described in Acts chapter 17. It grew from a small group of Jewish and Gentile believers and faced almost immediate persecution. In fact, Paul and his companions were driven out of town, and those who had given them shelter were arrested and tried, which makes the Thessalonian story even more amazing, given how short their contact with Paul was. Paul begins his letter with praise for the Thessalonians' faith and example. We give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before God our Father your work of faith and labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. In no other letter does Paul begin with such high praise for a local church. To be sure, he gives thanks for many of his churches in his letters, but then almost immediately begins to address some problem that has come up that is holding the church back, but not the Thessalonians. What made them different? And what can we learn from that? 
It turns out that the key to the Thessalonians' influence lay not in their ability to creatively think out of the box or to put the best programs in place or work with the latest strategy or technology. The Thessalonian church relied on copying what they had seen. The key to the Thessalonians' success was not innovation, but imitation. Rather than becoming the most unique church on the block, they became a faithful reproduction of what they saw. But to do that, they had to truly learn to see what was going on around them. And that is where we want to go with our lesson today. In the Old Testament, imitation is generally discouraged. For instance, in Deuteronomy, the word imitate is used in relation to the practices to be avoided. With regard to the practices of the nations that the Israelites had driven out of the promised land, Deuteronomy says in chapter 12, verse 30, take care that you are not snared into imitating them. And again, in chapter 18, verse 9, you must not learn to imitate the abhorrent practices of these nations. But in the New Testament, imitation is one of the most important traits a follower of Christ can have. Over and over, Christ commands his disciples to follow him. Paul tells the Corinthian church to be imitators of me as I am of Christ in 1 Corinthians 1, 11, 1. To the church in Ephesus, he writes, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, Ephesus 5, Ephesians 5, 1. And the letter to the Philippian church that Pastor Josh preached from last Sunday Paul wrote, brothers and sisters, join me in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us, Philippians 3.17. In the letter of Hebrews, it encourages, remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith, Hebrews 13.7. And the third letter of John combines both the Old Testament and New Testament ideas warning his followers, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. However, the key to imitation is really seeing that which you want to imitate. It is here that the Thessalonian church seemed to excel above their peers in the act of seeing. I have shared in the past that I went to a historically black seminary. One of the greatest compliments that could be paid someone there is that you saw them. From a slave culture, to be seen had more than a visual context. It meant it had a relational, spiritual, and existential one as well. It was an acknowledgement that you saw someone as a soul, a whole person of worth and value, and not just as an object. It is this type of seeing that I believe the Thessalonian church excelled at. First of all, the Thessalonians came to really see the apostles and who they were as followers of Christ. Paul writes, You know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. He goes on to say, You are witnesses, and God also, of how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you, believers. As you know, we dealt with each of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. The Thessalonians took that witness and embraced it and used it not only to inform their lives, but as a pattern for living their lives. The Thessalonians internalized what they saw in the apostles with life-changing effect, so much so that their way of life became the envy of those who encountered them. And because of this, the gospel began to spread among their neighbors. But there's more to it than that. The behavior of Paul and his companions caused the Thessalonians to see themselves as they were. People with something missing in their lives that only God could fill. Paul writes that they turned from idols to serve the living God and wait for his son from heaven. What they saw in the apostles convinced them of a lack in themselves that motivated them to abandon their former way of life and embrace a new life in Christ. The Thessalonians came to give themselves over to this new way of life with such passion that Paul observed of them, We know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, 
but also in the power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. This new life in Christ permeated the day-to-day -day life of the members of the Thessalonian church, and it became their defining characteristic. So much so that you could not speak of the Thessalonian church without mentioning their work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did the Thessalonians imitate what they saw in the apostles, but it caused them to see themselves as God saw them and to turn to Christ for healing. Finally, as the Thessalonian church embraced their new life in Christ, imitating the example of Paul and his companions, they became an example for others to imitate. Paul writes, You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned from God, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Their example was so widely reported that Paul and his companions were hearing it from the people they encountered. The stories of the Thessalonians spread faster than the gospel and laid the groundwork for Paul's own efforts as an evangelist. I believe this was possible because in learning to see the apostles for who they were and the Thessalonians seeing themselves as they were, they came to see those around them in a new light. They came to see the people of their community as like unto themselves. They saw the same needs in others that they had come to see in themselves. In doing so, they became apostles to a whole new group of neighbors sharing freely what they had received. They did it with such zeal and compassion and generosity of spirit that they became examples to an entirely new generation of Christ followers by the sheer weight and authenticity of their testimony and example. What about us, church? How well have we learned to see those who provided an example for our faith? How much did their teaching come to define our lives? How well do we perceive our own need for the work of the gospel in our own lives? How well are we living that out? Are we so defined by what Christ has done for us that it defines us? Do we live out the gospel to such an extent that those who watch us would identify us by our faith? Do those actions shine brightly enough that they become a beacon to others? And do we see around us clearly enough to see our former selves in our neighbors and reach out a helping hand to them? The Church of the Thessalonians calls us to us across time. It challenges us not to be simply hearers of the word, but doers. Their example challenges us to walk in the footsteps of our predecessors in the faith and to see and embrace the example they set. It challenges us to realistically evaluate ourselves and think deeply about what the power of the gospel has done in our own lives, to be intimately familiar with what it has been and what by the grace of God and by the power of his love we have come, grown to become. And finally, to see in others what was once in ourselves, and armed with that knowledge of how far we have come, to become the example for others to imitate. Our call is to imitate the Thessalonian church as they imitated Christ. In doing so, our own story will spread and shine a light so powerful that it will attract and encourage our neighbors to imitate us. Amen. Sure.
in our service where we want to prepare our hearts and minds for communion. And as was mentioned by our lay leaders earlier, you should have gathered with you the elements that you need to celebrate communion there at home. And so we take a moment so that you can gather those together and join us in the celebration of Holy Communion. Paul called the Thessalonian church to be imitators of him as he imitated Christ and had, as his followers sought to imitate Christ. And we do that as well, week to week, as we come to gather around the Lord's table to celebrate the key elements of the gospel story that brought us salvation through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Holy God, you created us in your image to love and to be loved. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only Son, Jesus Christ, you broke the power of sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself for us, he took bread he gave it to his disciples and said, Take all of you and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, when the supper was ended, he took the cup and again he gave you thanks. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take all of you and drink of this. This is the cup of my blood of the new covenant. It is being poured out for you and for many so that sins may be forgiven. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me.
And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with each other, one with Christ, and one in ministry to the entire world until Christ comes again in glory and we feast with him at his heavenly banquet. Through Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, forever and ever. Amen. And now, confidently, as children of God, let us join together in the prayer that our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who share in that loaf are one body. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. And the cup we share in is a sharing in the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation that takes away the sins of the world. This is the blood of Christ, given for you. After you've shared communion together, I invite you to either finish the elements or return them to nature. Once you've partaken in communion, I invite you to either finish the elements or return them to nature. And now, let us join our Lord in his heavenly feast. of the Thessalonians calls us not so much to be innovators, but imitators, which is a defining characteristic of those who follow Jesus Christ. And so, as you go forth this week, become imitators who can be imitated in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>